I'd like to say my main point here is to discuss skeptical thought in the raw material, not just me ripping on this Vice article. However, it's time for me to start ripping on this Vice article. I hope you see the connection I'm making. It appears evident that we're being colonized by an interdimensional spiritually enlightened civilization. It's really easy to debunk the material by picking apart the most incredulous edges while not understanding what the core is saying. But wait until you learn that this diamond perfectly frames the Queen's chamber. What the f***? The nature of channeled messages is that which will always prove to be somewhat inaccurate. And with this being the case, it's essential to understand the cohesion behind the complex logic structures introduced by the material. Picking apart the extraneous manifestations instead of ever addressing the point is lazy skepticism and doesn't serve to actually debunk anything. This book is an exact transcript from tape recordings of 26 sessions of an experiment designed to communicate with an extraterrestrial being. We started the experiment in 1962 and refined the process for 19 years. In 1981, the experimental results of our efforts changed profoundly in quality and precision. This book is simply a report of the beginning of this latter phase of our work. The 106 sessions of the raw materials still remain a mystery. There's currently no adequate explanation as to how its authors were able to, through apparently supernatural means, introduce such a solid conceptual framework to the world. This series is intending to detail this conceptual framework in the clearest light possible, with special emphasis on how it integrates into mysticism, the study of the occult, religion, and much, much more. Before we begin exploring the entirety of the intro, let us expand an insight Don had regarding a more adequate scientific paradigm. The incredible institutions of scientific thought as we know them today began as a humble dream handed down to Descartes by an angel. But now, with all of the crisis present in our current era, we begin to wonder if scientific thought is going to be what carries us across the finish line, so to speak. If there was ever an age, a trial of time, in which humanity had to pass through this concept called the Great Filter, Surely it is now, with the potential for a nuclear holocaust, wrathful catastrophe, and growing concerns of an oligarchic dystopia, perhaps it is time to look at science as another tool within the utility belt instead of our only way out. As covered in the last video, paranormal phenomena is a pretty divisive topic which generates strong feelings in a variety of directions. Its exploration goes against our traditional methods of science, and we currently see a lot of polarization and acceptance of its potential validity as a result of this. Why is our current scientific paradigm so closed off to the potential of occult reality? <laughs> Dig in remote places, extract extremely rare rocks, perform a forming spell on the rocks, extreme heat and pressure are required, Inscribe microscopic arcane sigils into your magical stones. Imbue the stones with lightning. The stones gain anima. The stones speak in a language incomprehensible to all mankind. Certain trained warlocks can control the power of the stones. They learn the language of the stones. The warlocks harness the magical stones' powers to bring forth light and image. The rest of the population is in awe. If the foundation of every religion is an integration of human tradition, practices, and beliefs in relation to the supernatural, does that make these truths perpetrated by scientific reasoning not just as hard to believe as those generated by religion? No! Knowledge gained by scientific reasoning is much easier to accept thanks to tools like deductive reasoning, testable explanations, and predictable results. If this is the case, it only makes sense that paranormal phenomena is not widely accepted by proponents of scientific methodology, as it does not fit any of the logical shackles required for its validation. However, that does not mean this entire body of reality is false. Supernatural phenomena does not offer the same control over variables in contrast to natural phenomena. How are you supposed to test something scientifically if performing a scientific experiment 
becomes impossible past a certain point. It's not as if the phenomena in question is unscientific, it's more so that it's practically impossible to correctly perform a scientific experiment because there are variables outside of our control, variables which need to be controlled if the experiment is allowed to be labeled as proper science. Hence what we have here, with Don calling on the necessity of a more adequate scientific paradigm. If science is a man-made invention created to know and predict natural phenomena, perhaps it is being asked to grow in a direction it is uncomfortable with. The unknown, the uncontrollable, the mysterious. Being tasked with the duty to effectively measure the realm of the occult is going to take a little bit of creativity, because what we're attempting to do here is scientifically probe into a world which ardently resists being measured in any concrete way. The raw material is created within the confines of a scientific experiment, but because the nature of the experiment works with variables which cannot be controlled, the communications cannot be considered proper science. Fundamentally, our aim is to use the higher faculty of rationality in order to more accurately pin down the real. However, the nature of our world dictates it impossible to control every variable when measuring certain aspects of reality. Science may be a more reliable ally than blind faith in the quest towards understanding infinity, but right now we live in a world on the brink of decay. If a science guided by absolute materialism feels itself unable to treat the social ills of our era, we then turn our heads towards a system of thought better equipped towards understanding that burning question in our hearts. What is really going on? Absolute truth is an evolving paradigm. The truth will inevitably swallow whatever new ideology seems to crop up in opposition to itself. Because unlike ideology, the truth is absolute. To align yourself with the truth is to choose enlightenment. So we ask ourselves, what is the best way to discover the truth? What is the most efficient path to enlightenment? I guess I'm just exploring what the aliens existing outside of time weigh in with. Don, our primary researcher, flashes his credentials within the vast field of occult study and labels the raw material his magnum opus. Using a technique called tuned trance telepathy, the group manages to produce 106 sessions of an alleged communication with an extraterrestrial race which identifies as Ra. The raw material is something that's existence puzzled even its authors, with its validity being left in the air as a body of data that simply is. It appears that Ra not only knows English, but also received permission to land on Earth as a galactic emissary of sorts, with the intention of assisting humanity as a fellow species of consciousness. They claim that this endeavor was a mistake, and have been closely monitoring this planet in order to alleviate any problems they may have helped create, making the assertion that they originated from Venus and now exist interdimensionally outside of time, we find it to be of little surprise that there were challenges in communication. P because they are a sentient species which has evolved for millions of years past where we are now, and also don't experience linear time anymore. Now that the Law of One is freshly clarified for those with a heart that feels, ears that hear, and eyes that see, we begin to look at this truly ageless philosophy from a fundamental level. We first begin to live the Law of One by recognizing its primal law of free will, a force which creates slavery and liberation, bondage and salvation, ignorance and enlightenment. It is from this law that we are granted awareness of our individuated reality. We are blessed with knowledge that our choices help create this reality. By its very nature, this is of course free to be believed or not believed, However, regardless of subjective belief, if the law of one is truly describing an objective reality of sorts, it means that we are being informed that this law simply is, and choosing to believe whether gravity is real or not doesn't make its phenomena any less apparent to those of us who don't have their heads in the sand. Similarly, science only acts as a way to explain phenomena. To explore the potential of an objective reality, and surely does not grasp the whole picture, hence our current state of the world. We see the Law of One philosophy as a blending of science and spirituality, 
Because regardless of whether or not science is doing a good job mapping and explaining the way the world works, it has failed to explain such integral questions relative to the human spirit, such as, why do we exist? And what happens after we die? Perhaps we see concepts like absolute heat, Planck length, and heat death of the universe as poetic expressions that there is a breaking down of natural law past a certain point. And this leads the imagination to question the laws governing the world behind this veil of material unknowns. We find that even the mathematical comfort of physics, there still exists an absolute. In contrast to the great objective world of science, we begin to turn our eyes towards the vast mystery of esoteric thought spread throughout time and culture. We are informed through virtually every spiritual tradition on the planet that the only thing we take with us through the great doorway of death is personality. With an acceptance of who you are and where you are at, with this knowledge that we are the creator of reality, we are afforded the potential to work upon ourselves and grow closer to this magical personality which can survive even the titanic transformation of death. But this is all the choice. Before delving deeper into the intro, I will leave off on this classic piece of Hermetica. If then you do not make yourself equal to God, you cannot apprehend God, for like is known by like. Leap clear of all that is corporeal and make yourself grown to a like expanse with that greatness which is beyond all measure. Rise above all time and become eternal. Then you will apprehend God. Think that for you too nothing is impossible. Deem that you too are immortal and that you are able to grasp all things in your thought, to know every craft and science. Find your home in the haunt of every living creature. Make yourself higher than all heights and lower than all depths. Bring together in yourself all opposites of quality, heat and cold, dryness and fluidity. Think that you are everywhere at once, on land, at sea, in heaven. Think that you are not yet begotten, that you are in the womb, that you are young, that you are old, that you have died, that you are in the world beyond the grave. Grasp in your thought all of this at once, all time and places, all substances and qualities and magnitudes together, then you can apprehend God. Close your eyes and let the mind expand. Let no fear of death or darkness arrest its course. Allow the mind to merge with mind. Let it flow out upon the great curve of consciousness. Let it soar on the wings of the great bird of duration up to the very circle of eternity. Hermes Trismegistus Okay, yeah, kind of dramatic, but truth of the soul and the afterlife deserve much greater justice than what's offered within the current marketplace of ideas. With this in mind, see this video as another layer of coverage on how much supernatural phenomena the material throws at you once you begin digging into its secrets. First, we covered UFOs, aliens, and channeling. Next, low-level skeptical thought with clarification on a few incredulous concepts. And now, finally, we are working through the entire intro with a special focus towards dispelling antiquated perceptions of God, polishing up the conceptual poverty associated with divinity, and the raw alien's usage of the word creator. But before we get to any of that nonsense, let's cover Carla's first introduction to the material here. She explains our history with Don, mentioning their meeting in 1962 and noting Don's propensity towards occult research despite his profession as a college professor. Having performed nearly 200 hypnotic age regressions with the intention of discovering the truth of the matter in regards to reincarnation, we then learn of the duo's humble climb up within the skill set of channeling. This channeling experiment was intended to achieve contact with extraterrestrials and had a rough start. Eventually, the group was enlightened by someone who actually knew what they were doing, and results began to flood in. As Don set his intention on discovering the mystery of being through contact with extraterrestrials, we see the raw material serving as the ultimate manifestation of this endeavor. Thanks to the help of Walter Rogers from Detroit, research intensified, Carla quit her job as librarian, and the duo begins probing various seances, seeking personal certainty regarding the materialization-dematerialization phenomena found present within a wide variety of UFO cases. 
Eventually, the group meets a minister of the spiritualist church, Reverend James Tingley of Toledo. Here they find deep satisfaction within the scope of the materialization phenomena, witnessing spirits that are not from this dimension appear in intense detail right before their eyes. After such a vivid experience, Don stresses that Carla should take the art of channeling much more seriously, and they begin a routine of daily practice instead of their usual weekly sessions. The two create LNL Research in 1970, publishing Secrets of the UFO in 1976. The book features a large body of channeled messages found in the unpublished manuscript, The Voices of the Gods, in which its content I believe became publicly accessible in some form or another through either the LNL Research channeling archives or other work published by the organization. Okay, across quite a bit of LNL content prior to the raw material, Uri Geller is frequently mentioned. Personally, I've always been a little suspicious of his claims, so I'm not going to be exploring them in much depth. Basically, his story is the one about psychic powers bending spoons. I'm going to instead offer an explanation regarding these types of occurrences, courtesy to fundamental law. With the law of free will being perhaps the most fundamental force existent within the fabric of reality, we find that evidence of supernatural phenomena never quite seems to manifest with absolute proof. You can of course deny that Uri Geller's story means anything. UFO abductions, cryptid sightings, bending spoons with your mind, a solitary supernatural experience does little for pushing the scope of what's possible in the heart of the group soul. However, experiences like these tend to have major effects towards those who came face to face with phenomena of the type. An idea I've seen tossed around quite a bit is the notion that before incarnation, that is, before your consciousness decides to play a role in the human experience, one agrees to a type of contract which enables this paranormal experience to occur. The greater idea here being that we should view this fundamental force of free will as the most powerful aspect of reality, and in relation to the last idea, this implies that these experiences aren't meant to prove to the masses that psychic powers are real. They're intended to provide some type of catalyst for those that either experience the anomaly or those who trust their claims. Again, not trying to prove or disprove Geller's claims, just using his case to detail a trend within the field of occult science with its possible mechanisms made clear thanks to knowledge of fundamental law. Returning to Don, we enter a more scientific frame of mind and the quest towards understanding the message of the UFOs. Don repeats a common sentiment throughout a wide variety of spiritual material, being that our conscious awareness is only experiencing a specific channel of reality, while in actuality, there is a lot more going on. Or in Law of One speak, our primary conscious awareness is acting within third dimensional light, despite the coexistence of all other dimensions. He also refers to a planet as a type of spiritual distillery, which is an analogy I'm very fond of. Basically, a soul spends a certain amount of time incarnating in a planetary sphere before being refined enough to reach higher planes of existence. Perhaps aliens are simply entities who have passed through the same process, creatures who have reconciled with their divine nature and became gods. Don goes on to give a lengthy analogy about how particle physics has figured out that the physical elements which compose our material universe are mostly empty space. His scientific background makes the raw material much more interesting and gives really valuable insight into the issues between science and spirituality. I quote, Senior scientists would be the first to agree that there is no such thing as an absolute scientific explanation of anything. Science is... Rather, a method or tool of prediction, relating one or more observations to each other. In physics, this is usually done through the language of mathematics. Our scientific learning is a learning by observation and analysis of this observation. In the sense of penetrating the fundamental essences of things, we really do not understand anything at all. Saving discussion about the damage religious fundamentalism and its counterpart, absolute materialism has done to the human spirit, we instead turn our focus towards this phrase, fundamental essence of things. 
It just so happens that the raw material introduces a very solid conceptual framework given through completely supernatural means, leading me to believe that this fundamental essence of things has never been more clear. In contrast to our well-established world of modern science, occult research is considerably lacking in comparison. One of the intentions behind our session-by-session -session breakdown series here is to not only explore the raw material in some depth, but also highlight how it integrates into the current state of our world. Our primary technique to furthering the field of occult science as a whole will be clear, concise definitions of fundamental law, along with evidence of its reality. This will serve as our metaphysical absolute, the very beginning of our grand occult theory. Once sufficient evidence has been provided, we can then start drawing conclusions, and this signifies that the game has changed. Of course, we'll cover it again, so instead of defining fundamental law now, you can either pause the video and read the image, or watch my first video on the raw material which describes fundamental law while the Thousand Year Door music plays. Pretty cool opportunity if you ask me. Blah blah blah, the universe is super big. Blah blah blah, science is an evolving paradigm. Time to move into this bit about unified field theory and Larsonian physics. Look, I'm not a physicist, so I'll play with these ideas as best as I can. Keep in mind, about 40 years have progressed since the creation of this intro, so expect some discrepancies between what was theorized in the past and what is scientifically accepted now. Now, Dewey B. Larson's thing was labeling three dimensions of space and three dimensions of time. The bigger takeaway here being the notion that time is not necessarily a linear thing, and us experiencing linear time is a pretty unique thing, relatively speaking, of course. Don makes the bold claim that Larsonian physics will bring us closer to a unified field theory, and this raises some eyebrows considering 40 years later, there still is not an accepted unified field theory. However, I do of course have a magic object in the back seat, which might mean something to someone, or at least it's really interesting. In consideration of the fact that the Ra entities are trying to teach the Law of One, it only makes sense that this law exists in some form or tradition on this planet. We're not looking at ancient mystery schools, instead we turn our heads to the Hidden Hand AMA. No, not that one. Yes! On the last page of the Erisipi Mirevte dialogue, a prominent body of information known well by the Law of One community, we are met with the following. Garrett Lisi inadvertently proved the existence of what many have called God, and no one believed his claims or knew what they revealed. The mathematics of quantum mechanics tells us this is how the world works at tiny scales can be summed up in a single sentence. Everything that can happen does. So the most familiar charge is electric charge. Electrons have an electric charge of negative one, and quarks have electric charges in thirds. So when two up quarks and a down quark are combined to make a proton, it has a total electric charge of plus one. These particles also have antiparticles, which have opposite charges. Now it turns out that electric charge is actually the combination of two other charges, hypercharge and weak charge. If we spread out the hypercharge and weak charge and plot the charges of particles in this two-dimensional charge space, the electric charge is where these particles sit along the vertical direction. The electromagnetic and weak forces interact with matter according to their hypercharge and weak charge, which make this pattern. This is called the unified electroweak model and was put together back in 1967. The reason most of us are only familiar with electric charge and not both of these is because of the Higgs particle. The Higgs, over here on the left, has a large mass and breaks the symmetry of this electroweak pattern. It makes the weak force very weak by giving the weak particles a large mass. Since this mass of Higgs sits along the horizontal direction in this diagram, the photons of electromagnetism remain massless and interact with electric charge along the vertical direction in this charge space. So the electromagnetic and weak forces are described by this pattern of particle charges in two-dimensional space. We can include the strong force by spreading out its two charge directions and plotting the charges of the force particles and quarks along these directions. The charges of all known particles can be plotted in a four-dimensional charge space and projected down to two dimensions like this so we can see them. 
Whenever particles interact, nature keeps things in a perfect balance along all four of these charge directions. If a particle and antiparticle collide, it creates a burst of energy and a total charge of zero in all four charge directions. At this point, anything can be created as long as it has the same energy and maintains a total charge of zero. For example, this weak force particle and its antiparticle could be created in a collision. In further interactions, the charges must always balance. One of the weak particles could decay into an electron and an antineutrino. And these three still add to zero total charge. Nature always keeps a perfect balance. So these patterns of charges are not just pretty. They tell us what interactions are allowed to happen. And we can rotate this charge space in four dimensions to get a better look at the strong interaction, which has this nice hexagonal symmetry. In a strong interaction, a strong force particle, such as this one, interacts with a colored quark, such as this green one, to give a quark with a different color charge, this red one. And these strong interactions are happening millions of times each second in every atom of our bodies, holding the atomic nuclei together. But these four charges corresponding to three forces are not the end of the story. We can also include two more charges corresponding to the gravitational force. When we include these, each matter particle has two different spin charges, spin up and spin down. So they all split and give a nice pattern in six-dimensional charge space. We can rotate this pattern in six dimensions and see that it's quite pretty. Right now, this pattern matches our best current knowledge of how nature is built at the tiny scales of these elementary particles. This is what we know for certain. Some of these particles are at the very limit of what we've been able to reach with experiments. From this pattern, we already know that particle physics at these tiny scales, the way the universe works at these tiny scales, is very beautiful. But now I'm going to discuss some new and old ideas about things we don't know yet. We want to expand this pattern using mathematics alone and see if we can get our hands on the whole enchilada. We want to find all the particles and forces that make a complete picture of our universe. And we want to use this picture to predict new particles that we'll see when experiments reach higher energies. So there's an old idea in particle physics that this known pattern of charges, which is not very symmetric, could emerge from a more perfect pattern that gets broken, similar to how the Higgs particle breaks the electroweak pattern to give electromagnetism. In order to do this, we need to introduce new forces with new charge directions. When we introduce a new direction, we get to guess what charges the particles have along this direction, and then we can rotate it in with the others. If we guess wisely, we can construct the standard charges in six charge dimensions as a broken symmetry of this more perfect pattern in seven charge dimensions. This particular choice corresponds to a grand unified theory introduced by Petit and Salam in 1973. When we look at this new unified pattern, we can see a couple of gaps where particles seem to be missing. This is the way theories of unification work. A physicist looks for larger, more symmetric patterns that include the established pattern as a subset. The larger pattern allows us to predict the existence of particles that have never been seen. This unification model predicts the existence of these two new force particles, which should act a lot like the weak force, only weaker. Now, we can rotate this set of charges in seven dimensions and consider an odd fact about the matter particles. The second and third generations of matter have exactly the same charges in six-dimensional charge space as the first generation. These particles are not uniquely identified by their six charges. They sit on top of one another in the standard charge space. However, if we work in eight-dimensional charge space, then we can assign unique new charges to each particle. Then we can spin these in eight dimensions and see what the whole pattern looks like. Here we can see the second and third generations of matter now, related to the first generation by a symmetry called triality. This particular pattern of charges in eight dimensions is actually part of the most beautiful geometric structure in mathematics. It's a pattern of the largest exceptional Lie group, E8. This Lie group is a smooth, curved shape with 248 dimensions. Each point in this pattern corresponds to a symmetry of this very complex and beautiful shape. One small part of this E8 shape can be used to describe the curved space-time of Einstein's general relativity, explaining gravity. Together with quantum mechanics, the geometry of this shape could describe everything about how the universe works at the tiniest scales. 
And the pattern of this shape, living in eight-dimensional charge space, is exquisitely beautiful. And it summarizes thousands of possible interactions between these elementary particles, each of which is just a facet of this complicated shape. As we spin it, we can see many of the other intricate patterns contained in this one. And with a particular rotation, we can look down through this pattern in eight dimensions along a symmetry axis and see all the particles at once. It's a very beautiful object. And, as with any unification, we can see some holes where new particles are required by this pattern. There are 20 gaps where new particles should be, two of which have been filled by the petit Salam particles. From their location in this pattern, we know that these new particles should be scalar fields, like the Higgs particle, but have color charge and interact with the strong force. Filling in these new particles completes this pattern, giving us the full E8. This E8 pattern has very deep mathematical roots. It's considered by many to be the most beautiful structure in mathematics. Thank you very much. And in a video titled As It Is, particle physics serving us an eight-dimensional model, which perfectly fits as the backbone for our new theoretical, empirically validated metaphysical reality, is a really big deal. The truth of particle interactions at the smallest scales imaginable means a complete mechanical knowledge of reality for the human group soul, which, among other things, unifies particles of matter with gravity, serving as a blueprint for a unified field theory. There's a poetic expression of fundamental law here, the unification between matter and gravity being some type of astro-theological manifestation of the law of love, or the intrinsic desire to seek the creator. Not to mention that this two-dimensional representation of Garrett's E8 lattice looks suspiciously like the 1,000-petaled crown chakra. Seriously, this shit belongs in the bottom of one of those iceberg images. The most sacred geometry. Crown chakra particle physics connection? Yate lattice mathematical proof of God? Anyways, the reason I'm getting into this is to bring what I have to the table in connection between the physical and metaphysical. Any kind of mathematical connection between the hierarchy of densities as posited by Ra in all likelihood lines up with this eight-dimensional object. Now that this much more valid concept as accepted by the current state of theoretical physics has been introduced, allow me to read the congruency Don found between the UFO message and Larson's theory as stated in the intro. I had been pondering several interesting statements communicated through contactees by the alleged UFO source prior to discovering Larson's work in the early 60s. Although the people who had received these communications knew nothing of the problems of modern physics, they were getting information which apparently was quite central to physical theory. First, they suggested that the problem with our science was that it did not recognize enough dimensions. Second, they stated that light does not move, light is. Larson's theory posits six dimensions instead of the customary four, and finds the pure field which Einstein believed would represent matter to move outward from all points in space at unit velocity, or the velocity of light. Photons are created due to a vibratory displacement in space-time, the fabric of the field. Furthermore, the contactees were saying that consciousness creates vibration, this vibration being light. The vibratory displacements of space-time in Larson's theory are the first physical manifestation, which is the photon or light. According to the UFO contactees, the UFOs lower their vibrations in order to enter our skies. The entire physical universe postulated by Larson is dependent on the rate of vibration and quantized rotations of the pure field of space-time. The contactees were suggesting that time was not what we think it is. Larson suggests the same thing. The UFOs were said to move in time as we move in space. This would be entirely normal in Larson's time-space portion of the universe. There's a fun connection here between the science behind UFO technology and Bob Lazar, but perhaps we will explore that someday in a later video. For now, we accept that until science can dematerialize objects out of our third dimensional reality and manipulate its trajectory through higher dimensional planes, it appears somewhat in opposition to the claims made by the raw aliens. The point Don is actually trying to get across here is a speculatory link between the UFO phenomena and the current state of physics. 
So I don't think he deserves much heat for putting forward his vision of a unified field theory, even if Larson's idea has some holes in it. For now, the science behind consciousness remains quite the mystery, for some stubborn reason. Don exits the scientific mysteries and we again tune into Carla as she shifts focus into the spiritual ones. Parallel to a UFO dematerializing out of fourth dimensional vibratory conditions and stepping down into third density light, we see much the same process and consideration of an eternal soul forgetting the higher dimensional properties of time-space and incarnating into a space-time experience. The intention behind the raw alien's message is to communicate knowledge which allows humanity to accelerate their spiritual evolution, or rather, to enable our familiar space-time experiential nexus to do work on our eternal time-space personality. There's a quick anecdote about a boy whose allergies are healed through spiritual mechanisms, with the greater takeaway here being a serious lesson about modern medicine. As the true nature of reality is spiritual, it only follows that the true nature of sickness is spiritual as well. This is the reason I so adamantly suggest scientific progress in the realm of the occult, because the more science fails to penetrate spiritual reality, the more it fails to heal the sick, advance society, and further the prosperity of the human race with the efficacy in which it would otherwise be allowed. Ultimately, any given spiritual system forever remains only a hypothesis until it begins to show some tangible results. Throughout the ages, many prominent figures have shared their enlightenment with the world. Hermes, Buddha, Jesus... However, I feel it disingenuous to call Buddhism and Christianity different religions. Really, they are both attempts to accurately depict and preserve a reverence for spiritual reality in the hearts of men. Lest the world forget its higher nature and fall into a dark age. Luckily, nothing like that has ever happened. Hmm. Still, I posit that the many planetary spiritual traditions should be meta-analyzed in order to determine the truth instead of the comical idea of picking the right one. This means atheism's clever, one god less, becomes diffused into the same mixing pot as everybody else. There is no elite, there is no better, there is only the harsh reality of our current situation and what is, and always has been, absolutely true. Baba boy. What we're attempting to do here is push the bounds of modern theology. This is not a small task to take on, so please bear with me as ideas refine themselves over the course of this series. Fittingly, this next part is a soft intro to some of the zanier concepts in the material, which I may have briefly covered in the last two videos. Please keep in mind, it can be difficult to put forward such incredulous ideas rationally. However, as this series carries on, I assure the more skeptical minds in the audience that these ideas will be given proper justice thanks to the continued unveiling of occult reality. Likewise, as taught by fundamentalist Christianity, if it's not worth understanding rationally, it's likely better to not be understood at all. Not only is Satan another group soul within the galactic neighborhood introduced, but also we are forced to properly come to terms with the word creator. The Western world as a whole leads such a dysgenic spirituality. Christianity had its time in the limelight and its failures directly birthed the modern scientific atheism we're so accustomed to today. Because in a world where the majority of people believe in a wrathful dictator in the sky who has the power to ruin lives, cause sickness, genocide, general tragedy, all while favoring certain subjects over others, rationality, sanity, and sensibility become faculties you clutch very close to your chest. On the contrary, even if an individual does not identify with the word atheist, their spiritual practices are generally so underdeveloped they may as well fit the definition. What we're truly focused on is the evolution of spiritual tradition in the West, and the raw material serves as a wonderful stepping stone on the journey. With such an intense focus on atheism, 
I believe it is time to start shifting some responsibility on its father. Yes, I'm looking at you. In the past, ultimately, the church determined what was true. This may or may not have caused many, many problems. Following this, we witness a variety of schisms spanning throughout the centuries, with the product of these unfoldments lending itself towards a society geared more towards liberation or, on the contrary, creating more ideal conditions for tyrannical oligarchy. We watch these two forces compete throughout the ages with notably greater cascades than our topic of concern, the church, but nevertheless, the quest for the truth is something that always seems to supersede any fixed structures in our world, especially when considering that the enlightenment of every era, by its very nature, is an intrinsic growing of the real becoming accepted in the hearts of many, despite whatever shackles seem to weigh progress so heavily. While we're speaking on the pitfalls of the church, a passage from Marie-Louise von Fran's book Alchemy came to mind. The conversation interjects our own via the topic of spiritual systems relative to dream interpretation, with an example given as I quote, Let us go back to the original traditions of little primitive groups, living together and say that a man among them has dreams or visions. There are two possibilities open to him. If he knows someone who is supposed to be a shaman or a medicine man or a priest, then he goes to him and accepts his interpretation, or he can remain independent and build up his own interpretation, draw his own conclusions, and work out a whole system. This is a lot of work! It's much easier to schism your way out of an uncomfortable situation than independently create your own entire spiritual system. Unfortunately, the true living word of Hermeticism, Christianity, Buddhism, and other spiritual traditions have grown quite distorted courtesy to the flow of time. Sure, they exist in some pure form if you know where to look, but altogether the mass confusion of our modern era begs for a fresh start, so to speak. Luckily for us, Don, Carla, and Jim too, I guess, gave their lives in service of providing the world an updated spiritual hypothesis more palatable to those who have found resonance with the contemporary waves of rationality which have swept through the world. Ugh, I don't want to bog this video down with quotes, but it resonates so well with the point I'm making. Another quote from Alchemy. So, science has progressed, but still any model becomes a cage. For if one comes across phenomena difficult to explain, then instead of being adaptable and saying that the phenomena does not conform to the model and that a new hypothesis must be found, one clings to one's hypothesis with a kind of emotional conviction and cannot be objective. Why shouldn't there be more than three dimensions? Why not investigate and see where we get? But that people could not do. The raw material may seem like this crazy one-off thing, but really it is sourced from a lifetime of study, self-sacrifice, and dedicated personal practice. Not only did the workings evolve from the regular practice of channeling for nearly 19 years, but that body of work came from an intense and honest study of paranormal phenomena. Hence why the material can come across as ridiculous at first, but with proper knowledge of the concepts being laid out, perhaps the communications may not be as crazy as one might initially think. Maybe. Well, it looks like things are coming to a close here. This was originally intended to be one video, but I'm going to have to make the intro breakdown a three-parter. I know, boo-hoo, but I feel it important in order to lay these ideas down properly. Today we explore the evolution of spiritual tradition in the West, and in next episode, we will be laying down some definitions which help demystify the mysticism. Anyways, I'll catch you guys later. See ya!